trying to be energetic. Yeah. Well, while we're switching over the audiovisual, I just wanted to alert people who are interested in birds and ornithology. There's a very interesting source called SaveTheEagles.org. A fellow by the name of Marc Duchamp out of Spain runs it, and he has all kinds of startling statistics about bird deaths due to wind turbines. For example, the Scottish eagle, and he was talking about Scotland, so it's quite relevant, is expected to be extinct within the next uh, few years, and you can learn more about it there. In one region of Spain alone, they kill a million birds a year. So I think this is an, actually a very interesting area where, like my talk yesterday, there is scope for cooperation between the right and the left. Apparently within the Sierra Club, there's a, quite a large debate between conservationists and global warming people. Okay, you want to stop global warming or save the birds? Well, there's, I think, a lot of scope for outreach of cooperation between the people who want to help animals and the birds and uh, people on our side as well, many of whom, of course, want to help birds too. Okay, the next speaker is Peter Ferrara. I should just tell you, uh, he was the chief economic policy advisor, actually, to Newt Gingrich, which I think is an interesting uh, fact, little fact. He currently is a Heartland Senior Fellow for Entitlement and Budget Policy. He's also a Senior Fellow at the Social Security Institute and the General Counsel of the American Civil Rights Union. So we're going to hear a different perspective from a technical scientific person. We're going to hear policy uh, and a law perspective, which should be very interesting. He served in the White House Office of Policy Development under President Reagan and as an Associate Deputy Attorney General of the United States under the first President Bush. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the Harvard Law School, and he's written several books, The Obamacare Disaster, which is available with the Heartland Institute, President Obama's Tax Piracy, and Amer America's Ticking Bankruptcy Bomb. That sounds like an interesting one. He has another broadside book recently published by Encounter entitled Obama and the Crash of 2013. That sounds pretty scary. Anyway, with that, I introduce Peter Ferrara. Thank you for that introduction, Tom. And uh, John's presentation is a perfect complement to mine. I'm going to be focusing on real choices. And first, I'm going to offer the capitalist choice. Exhibit A in support of that is the Bakken Geological Formation in North Dakota, which turns out to hold far, far more oil than the U.S. Geological Survey used to think, 25 times as much, that is 2,400% more, trillions of barrels of oil. The capitalist result of that is that the official unemployment rate in North Dakota is 3.5%. President Obama, are you listening? With nearly 20,000 jobs paying 60,000 to 80,000 a year, remaining unfilled for lack of qualified applicants. Revenues from the booming growth uh, is gushing into North Dakota state government so fast that after seven consecutive tax cuts, the state enjoys a rainy day fund of several billion dollars, even though the state's annual budget is only two billion. Newt Gingrich asked, quote, if North Dakota has that much energy, how much do we think we have everywhere else? Turns out we may have more oil in the United States today, given new science and technology, than we have actually pumped worldwide since 1870. We may, in fact, by one estimate, have three times as much oil in the United States as there is in Saudi Arabia, or as there ever was in Saudi Arabia, uh, unquote. Exhibit B, the Green River Formation. That's where uh, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming come together also holds more recoverable oil than the rest of the world's proven reserves combined. According to GAO, three trillion barrels of oil. At least half of that is recoverable, according to the RAND Corporation. That is equal to the world's, uh, pr entire world's proven reserves by itself as well. Tw two times the oil in the Middle East, enough to cover a U.S. consumption, oil consumption, for 200 years. Uh, but because this is on federal land, Mr. Obama currently has this entirely locked up. Then there's a parallel revolution in natural gas going on. We have long known there was a lot of natural gas in shale, but we did not know for a long time exactly how to get it out. As recently as 2000, people thought the U.S. had seven years of natural gas supply left in the United States. Investors actually began lining up money to fund uh, to, uh, the building of facilities for the importation of liquefied natural gas from the Middle East. But then entrepreneurs began applying to, to shale rock formations, to horizontal drilling techniques, 
that had been developed for deep water ocean drilling, where the most has to be gotten out of every hole drilled. I mean, you're going to drill under miles of water and then drill uh, deep into the, uh, 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 into the earth below the ocean. There's only so many of those holes you can afford to drill, so you've got to make the most out of every hole. So that's when they developed the horizontal drilling techniques that allow you to drill in any direction from that one hole. And the breakthrough was they combined that uh, horizontal drilling techniques with uh, the long-time technique of fracking that is, involves breaking up the shale rock with steam, water, and sand, supposedly so scary to environmentalists. And the net result, as Gingrich elaborated, was, quote, in one short decade, we went from seven years of supply to over 100 years of supply because science and technology had pr improved so much. Furthermore, instead of importing liquefied natural gas from the Middle East, there is now serious talk that we're going to be building facilities in Houston to ship liquefied natural gas to China. But this is all just the beginning, because as Newt Gingrich also added in discussing this issue, quote, in places like the Marcellus Shale in western Pennsylvania, in eastern Ohio, cutting down along the Appalachians, all the way out to Dallas, Texas, there is formation after formation after formation. Now what this means is that is what I reported last year in my book, America's Ticking Bankruptcy Bomb. America has the resources to be the world's number one producer of oil. The world's also the world's number one producer of natural gas. Also the world's number one producer of coal. Even the world's number one producer of nuclear energy. This is an astounding economic opportunity for America. Not only does this mean uh, uh, big bucks uh, for the private landowners who, who have these resources on their land, it means as well uh, big money for our bankrupt federal government. Gingrich also reported, quote, one of the leading experts in North Dakota has suggested that we might well have over the next generation $18 trillion, $18 trillion, not $18 billion, $18 trillion in royalties from the development of these resources. Note, that is bigger than the entire national debt. But that is not all. Gingrich added, quote, if you had $500 billion a year that was not going overseas, that was paying royalties in the U.S., paying landowners, paying people to go out and develop the oil, paying the pipeline builders, you would suddenly have a booming economy right here at home. And what that means is that suddenly we get a lot more jobs, people come off of unemployment insurance, food stamps, welfare, public housing, Medicaid, all that saves money, and they go to work instead taking care of their families and paying taxes. So government revenue goes up while expenditures go down. Second, as we develop this, the companies producing all this energy are going to make more profits, so they're going to pay more taxes. And the economy gets a further boost because every time gas and energy prices go up, they are the equivalent of a tax on working people and those who are retired. Similarly, every time gas and energy prices go down, it is like a big tax cut boosting the economy. And lower energy prices are a big uh, tax cut in particular for energy-intensive manufacturing. So uh, uh, when Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House, we paid $1.13 on average, $1.13 a gallon of gas on average during those four years. When Barack Obama became president, we paid $1.89 per gallon that very week he became president. Now it's more than double that. So is, Obama, is Barack Obama right that we can't get oil and gasoline prices to go down by in, through a drilling and increased production despite all these vast resources that I've just discussed? Well, Gingrich responded to Obama's claim by saying, well, let me give the president a brief history lesson. By 1980, under Jimmy Carter, gas was $3.30 a gallon, despite Carter's heavy-handed gas rationing. The first, but the first executive order Ronald Reagan signed deregulated gasoline. Now, the left was panic-stricken. The New York Times reported the prices would skyrocket. Within six months, however, of course, just the opposite happened, the prices collapsed. New York Times is a very valuable reverse indicator. You could buy that assuming the opposite of everything they said, you can get rich enough to buy the New York Times and close it down. <laughs> in fact, the collapsed oil price was a major factor in beating the Soviet empire because it stripped them of hard currency. Uh, by 1988, the price of gas was, had dropped to $1.72 a gallon, half the price when Reagan was sworn in, the result of eight years of drilling. Or let me give you a more recent example. In 2008, uh, 
uh, or since 2008, in the last four years, because of the uh, shale uh, natural gas b uh, boom that I was talking about, uh, the price of natural gra gas has dropped more than 80 percent because of all that increased production. So, so much for uh, President Obama's claim that you can't drill your way to lower prices. Uh, in fact, uh, reality is just the opposite, of course. So following this capitalist course, we can cut the price of gasoline in half, cut the price of electricity in half, in Fred Singer's words, produce cheaper fertilizer for farmers and lower food prices for everybody, provide cheaper transportation fuels for aviation and trucking, and lower raw material costs for the chemical industry. Uh, th these are all additional huge tax cuts promoting the economy, all these further effects. They provide the foundation for the renaissance of American manufacturing, which tends to be energy intensive, and the foundation for an economic boom <clears throat> that would close the deficit and ultimately pay off the national debt. Now, part of the cost of President Obama's red-slash-green vision of alternative energy is the opportunity cost of foregoing this capital, capitalist fossil fuel future. Instead, we would suffer a high-cost wind, solar, biofuel future. Again, again, U.S. government data, of course, we had a comprehensive, just had a comprehensive presentation on this, but the costs of wind are almost double the cost, or at least double the cost of traditional fossil fuel. In fact, offshore wind is nearly five times the cost of traditional fossil fuels. This is, again, on comparable units of energy produced. Solar, three to five times uh, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, uh, traditional fossil fuels. So instead of the huge pending tax cut from capitalist fossil fuels, this means a huge effective tax increase from high-cost energy. Instead of a booming energy industry fueling an historical, historic economic boom, it means closing down the entire coal industry from mining to power plants and probably phasing out oil and natural gas as well. That's a second-term agenda item. It means instead an entire energy industry that can only survive on corporate welfare, which is effectively an additional tax increase. So the uh, higher cost energy is itself a huge tax increase. That uh, uh, debilitates the economy. The fact that you have to pay welfare to keep that industry alive is another tax increase, further bringing the economy down. Uh, moreover, wind and solar must have fossil fuel backup for when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, which means even more adds even more to costs. EPA's continued implementation of cap and trade means trillions more in further effective tax increases. Instead of a manufacturing renaissance, this means a further manufacturing decline for America. Moreover, the tax increase of high cost energy must be viewed in the context of Obama's pending tax increases for next year. Most people do not know that already enacted in the current law for next year is increases in top tax rates of virtually every major federal tax because the Obamacare tax increases go into effect and the, uh, the Bush tax cuts expire, which President Obama refuses to renew for the nation's small businesses, job creators, and investors. That's the English translation of couples making over 250 and singles making over 200,000. So as a result, the top two tax rates are going to go up nearly 20 percent. The capital gains tax rate will go up nearly 60 percent. The tax on corporate dividends will nearly triple. The Medicare payroll tax will go up 62 percent for these disfavored uh, taxpayers. And the death tax will go up. God knows what it's a, it will all end up to. That's on top of the, the federal corp, the corporate tax rate, which is now under President Obama the highest in the industrialized world at nearly 40 percent. Even communist China has a 25 percent corporate rate. In the uh, Socialist European Union, it's below 25 percent. In formerly Socialist Canada, it's now 15 percent. Uh, this leaves American economy completely uncompetitive, uh, uh, uncompetitive, but under President Obama, there's no relief in sight. Instead, he spent the last two years barnstorming the country, calling for still more tax increases. When you add those tax rate increases on top of Obama's exploding regulatory costs, what you get is, uh, for next year, uh, another recession. That's Obama in the coming crash of 2013. It's available from Encounter Books, but a uh, longer explanation. But uh, effectively, he's already legislated in the current law a renewed recession for next year. Uh, if we are not already in another recession right this minute, because there are some economists now who think that by this fall, it will be recognized that a recession has already started this year, and won't that be a happy moment for voters to go to the polls with that thought in mind? That's the reason, ultimately, that we, uh, that is our ace in the hole. The re reason ultimately that we cannot but win uh, this fight and this debate because the American people will never 
vote for a decline in their standard of living. They don't even need to trace it to global warming or EPA or President Obama cap and trade. All they need to know is the gas prices are up, my kids can't get a job, I am never getting a raise, the prices keep going up in the store, I'm just going to vote out whoever's in office. That is how the American people are going to vote, and that's the, the final uh, ace in the hole that we have. Thank you very much.